I would like to look at uh, some verses found in 1 John. I didn't know that he, Brother Jonathan, was going to sing that last song. But before we get to those verses in 1 John, I want you to focus in on the last verse, fourth verse of that song. Our God who sat upon a tree, a life was willing there to give, that he from sin might set men free, and evermore with him should live. I want now to read from 1 John chapter 3. Be a little bit lengthy reading. We'll begin reading in verse 4. Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. And ye know that he was manifested to take away our sins, and in him, and in him is no sin. Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not, Whosoever sinneth hath not seen him, neither known him. Little children, let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. He that committeth sin is of the devil, for the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin, because he is born of God. Now I want you to keep that in mind, because there are those who say that when you are saved by God, it's all on God's side of the fence, and nothing you can do in order to be saved. And thus, when you are saved by God, then there's nothing you can do that's going to cause you to be lost. And they will cite the passage I just read, especially verses 8 and 9, and say, See, whosoever is born of God does not commit sin. And the automatic question is, were you born of God? Immediately we go back to John 3, verses 3 and 5, on the new birth. And we're taught that one is born of water and the Spirit, and the one that's not born of water and the Spirit cannot enter the kingdom of God. So we know then the born here, the matter of born of God, has to do with baptism. Now it's interesting that those who teach the doctrine that a child of God cannot so sin as to be eternally lost will deny the necessity of baptism for and to and or to the remission of sins, and will say you say the moment you believe without any other acts of obedience. Yet the new birth here harkens back to John 3, verses 3 and 5, which makes it clear you must be born of water and the Spirit. Well, it's the Holy Spirit that gave us the whole New Testament of Jesus Christ. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. The Greek word is a compound word, theophanistos, meaning God breathed or breathed out from God. Is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. That the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished into every good work. Now the Holy Spirit is the one that has revealed the mind of Christ to us regarding what God's done for us we never could do for ourselves and then what our responsibility to God is. And you remember this from Genesis to Revelation. He's never, 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 and as many other nevers as you ought to put on there, done for man what man could do for himself. And if you say, well, I just don't believe that. Well, then study your Bible real close. That's what you ought to do anyway, and you'll find out that's the case. And so when we come down to this, whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, there must be something here because guess what I find over here Earlier in the book, same Holy Spirit inspiring the same John, the Apostle John. And he says, in the very, what we have is the first chapter. In verse 8, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Well, have we got a contradiction? Over here, whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin. Over here, 
If we say that we have no sins, we deceive ourselves, the truth's not in us. Then he says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word's not in us. Then notice as we have it, chapter 2, verse 1. My little children, these things are right unto you that ye sin not. Well, I thought that if you were born of him, you didn't sin anyway. Why must he tell us not to sin? And if any man sin, well, he's writing this to Christians, isn't he? It's not written to those outside of Christ. He's writing to Christians. We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And here's where I'm headed with this. That's the reason I cited the last verse of Our God, He's Alive. Our God who sun upon a tree, a life was willing there to give that he from sin might set men free, nevermore with him to live. Now watch. And he, Christ, is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. And hereby we do know that we know him if we keep his commandments. He that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But... Whoso keepeth his word in him verily is a love of God, uh, verily is a love of God perfected. Now, let us know something here. Are you in love with God? Are you in love with his word? Well, you can find out. He says right here, but whoso keepeth his word in him verily is a love of God perfected. And then notice, hereby know we that we are in him. He tells us how to test ourselves. But the point I want to make here is on this business of propitiation. In the Old Testament, you come across the word atonement. They're more than double first cousins. <laughs> They're more like identical twins. The idea is that Christ atoned for our sins. The idea of atonement is a covering is placed over sins as if they were not there and God does not see them. Propitiation carries with the idea of one taking away our sins. That's what Christ did. And the emphasis here is on two things. What God did for us we could not do for ourselves. And then on what we can do for ourselves. You see, it even comes over once you are a member of the church. Because he's writing to members of the church. And he's talking about Christ being a propitiation for our sins. Whose sins? Those in the blood-bought body of Christ. Acts 20 and 28. But he died for the whole world. And not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Now, this same doctrine, Calvinism, teaches that Christ only died for those he predestined for, ordained to be saved. And they had no choice in the matter. Well, the Holy Spirit through John didn't know that. He said he also not only died for those who have believed and obeyed the gospel and members of the church, but also for the whole world. And by doing his will, we know that we know him. But you notice it is conditional if we keep his commandments. So that's a very important point I want to keep in mind. Now, what do we do about over here? When he says in verse 9 of chapter 3, Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin. What does he mean? He just said if we say we don't sin, we're lying and truth's not in us. What's he talking about? He's talking about what has happened to a person inwardly when he's been converted in the full meaning of that word converted. To be converted to Christ doesn't just mean being brought to a state of belief in Christ because of the truth you learned. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. Yes, it's that. But it's also a change of one's whole inward man. Repentance is where you die to the practice, habitual purpose, practice of sin. It's where you in your life says, I have been living as it suited me, no longer. Not my will, but thine be done from here on out. Thus you die to the practice of sin. Being that die death dead, it means separation, not annihilation. Then when we die to something, we quit it. But we're human beings. So therefore, from time to time, we will commit sin because of our humanity. 
but we don't intend to, we don't plan on it, we don't work at it, and lo and behold, what's John talking about? He tells us what happens and the blessings that are upon us when we do happen to sin. We have an advocate with the Father. So we have Jesus Christ who died on the cross originally to save us from our sins by the giving of His body, a sacrifice for sin, the shedding of His blood for the remission of our sins. Then we receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save our souls. We comply with God's plan of salvation, having a living, active faith that leads us to obey God and repenting of our sins, confessing our faith in Him, and then completing our obedience to Him and becoming a Christian by being immersed in water by the authority of Christ in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit for a given purpose. Not because we're already saved. That's not scriptural baptism. But in order to be saved. And these are not works that we conjured up. You wouldn't know about anything I said along that line. Didn't read your Bible, know it was there. Didn't come from me. It came from the Bible as to how we reach the saving blood of Christ that He shed for us on Calvary's cross. And so we see in Romans 6, 3 and 4, we're baptized into His death. What happened in His death? He shed His blood. Well, I've got to contact that blood. We'll look at verses 17 and 18 of Romans 6. God be thanks you were the servants of sin, but you've obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine, form of doctrine, form of doctrine, pattern of teaching. What is the world a form of doctrine, a pattern of teaching? Romans 6, 3 and 4. The death, the burial, and resurrection of Christ. Now nobody could go back to the cross, stand under it with the blood dripping from Christ, then go with him into the tomb, stay with him there, till he came out of the tomb on the third day, but you can obey a form of doctrine from the heart. From the heart means all that is your inward man, your heart. It's your spirit. It's the real you that will never cease to be. When you leave this life, you go into torment forevermore, eventually, of course, after the judgment, or you go into glory forevermore. Only two places to go. Based upon how you receive with meekness are not the engrafted word. So when we receive the truth, then what does the truth do to us? Well, there's this, not only a change of mind, a cessation of sin, purpose, practice, habitual sin at repentance, but you take that dead man who's died to sin and you bury him. And you baptize him into the death of Christ so the blood of Christ can cover him. That's the obeying of the form of doctrine. And you don't bury a live man. Well, if you say point of belief, you'd be buried a live man. But you don't. You bury a dead man. And that man's dead to sin by his own choice. He breaks down his old stubborn will, the seat of all sin, the seat of all sin and rebellion against God. I've said more times than I can count. So, but God, be thankful that you were the servants of sin, the slaves of sin. That's where you used to be. Slaves to sin. But you've obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine, death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. And what happened? Being then made free from sin. When's the then? When is the then? The then is when you obey the form of doctrine. So you can say, well, the then is the when. The then is when you obey the form of doctrine. You bury a dead man, and he's raised to walk in what? Newness of life. He's a new creature. Where? In Christ. Well, if you read Ephesians 1, 3, you find out God's located all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. Galatians 3, 26 and 27, especially verse 27, says we're baptized into Christ. And thus, we enjoy the propitiation of Christ. We know then the truth of God, setting forth God's plan of salvation. There were your hands and butts about it. You don't have to wonder. You don't have to say, well, I feel bad today, I must be lost. I feel good today, I must be saved. You know whether from the heart you've done what the Bible said, the way he said it, for the reason he said it. So whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin. The verse doesn't end there, does it? It says, for his seed remaineth in him. What's the seed? Luke 8, 11 says the seed of the kingdom is the word of God. As long as the word of God's leading and guiding and directing you, how do you sin? You don't. That's the point he's making. 
as long as you're living in harmony with the truth of God and discharging your obligations as a child of God in the church for our Lord, that's the seed remaining in you. And you don't sin purposely, regularly, and habitually. You left that behind when you died to the habitual practice of sin. When you repented. So when we look at this then, what's he saying? We don't want to stand up here and say, well, I never sinned. I'm a Christian. What we ought to say is, as a Christian, I never intend to sin. I never do it deliberately. If I sin, it's because human flesh is frail. And there's also the sin of ignorance. We always talk about once we're baptized into Christ, we are babes in Christ. As Peter said, his newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that ye may grow thereby. Well, do you know any more about living the Christian life now than you did some of us 40 years ago or 20 years ago or even 10 years ago? I hope so. If you don't, then you haven't grown. Well, what took care of you in growing from when in your ignorance you were back there, though you knew enough to obey the gospel and be saved, and where you are now? What kept you? The whole plan of salvation. The flowing blood of Christ, 1 John 1, 7. That's what kept you. A Christian, as soon as they see that they do commit sin due to the infirmities of the flesh, the fact we're human, or we're ignorant and we've grown into deeper knowledge of the truth now, I, I, I can think of a number of things over my life to where I now know things at this time that I didn't back then. What do you think growth is? It's not coming to greater knowledge of something or new knowledge of things. Doesn't mean that you didn't know the truth to become a Christian, but then you're a baby in Christ. Now you're expected to grow in Christ. Well, what keeps you between being a babe and being a, a mature child of God? What keeps you safe? It has to be the blood of Christ. And nothing else will. Nothing else is going to clean one sin with the blood of Christ. Well, when did you contact that blood? When you were baptized into his death. Well, what does it continue to do? Well, as I walk in the light, he is in the light. I have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth me from all sin. Well, what's he telling us? The person who is a, ch person who's a child of God, who enjoys the propitiation of Christ, having from the heart obeyed the gospel of Christ, his state's changed because he's baptized into Christ. He was outside of Christ. And in being baptized into Christ, all of his alien sins, those sins he committed that separated him from God to begin with, have been forgiven. Now he stands as a newborn babe in Christ, a new creature in Christ. And one of those blessings that the blood of Christ that was shed, that we contact the waters of baptism, continues to cleanse us. On the basis of what? 1 Corinthians 15, verse 58. We continue steadfastly in the Apostles' Doctrine, Acts 2.42. Our labor in the Lord, 1 Corinthians 15, 58, is not in vain. So it allows for growth and development. It allows for us to not deliberately go about to, to remain ignorant, but deliberately go about to gain knowledge, study, to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needed not to be ashamed, right to divine word of truth. Folks, that wasn't said originally to people that were just rising from the water of God of baptism. It was said to a young preacher. Now, if a young preacher needed to hear that about his own growth and development, when he's already knowing enough to preach the truth, and look at how Paul says Timothy was, then what kept him as he grew in greater knowledge and grace of Christ? What had to be the blood of Christ? The seed of the Lord remained in him. He did not deliberately try to do wrong, not caring about right as the Bible pictures the right, but he dedicated his life from the time of obedience to the gospel to living like the Lord wanted him to. Now there will never be a time, brethren, if you live here a thousand years and you have the mind of Einstein and you use it like Paul did studying the Bible, you're going to still need to grow and develop. You cannot live a flawless life here on this earth. You're a human being. That's why we have a Savior. I think we lose sight sometimes that when we say, Christ is my Savior. Some of us think, well, I obey the gospel, baptized to Christ, I'm a Christian, um, I save myself. The only way you save yourself is like 
Peter said on the day of Pentecost, save yourself this untoward generation. What does that mean? Fulfill your responsibility to believe and obey the gospel so Christ can save you. That's exactly what, what the deal is. There'll never be a time on this earth as a member of the church that we don't have to have a Savior, that we don't need the blood of Christ. Never. But who is the blood of Christ going to cover? The person doesn't care, won't study the Bible, won't pray, won't assemble, just gone back into the ways of the world, living on the level of the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. I won't cover you. Because you're deliberately sitting and not caring about the truth. But it's going to cover that person who with regularity studies the Bible, prays, tries to understand and to do all things, ready unto every good work as the Bible defines those good works. What does that person do? Because he's not flawless. But the seeds remaining in him or he wouldn't be doing the things I just described. And the blood of Christ cleanses him. We don't know when our end will come in walking in our fleshly bodies. But we don't have to be concerned about that. We don't have to be concerned about it at all. All we have to do is be faithful. And what's going to happen? The blood's going to cleanse us. So whether we're up in the airplane that decides to hit the ground kind of hard and scatter us all over the place, or whether we're preaching like I am now and have a heart attack and that ends it, or whether we die over a period of a couple of years from cancer or whatever it might be, what difference does it make? It takes the blood of Christ to save us, whether you're 20 years old and just baptized, or whether you're 80 years old and baptized 60 years ago. Study your Bible every day, taught people, led them to Christ, taught them the gospel. What's going to allow you to stand before the Lord on the day of judgment and he say to you, well done, thou good and faithful servant, enter ye into the joys of thy Lord, the blood of Christ. That's exactly what it is. So the seed remains in. What does it mean? A person who's a member of the church keeps on keeping on and does not give up. Be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord for as much as you. Look at the solid part of it. No, your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Our labor a lot of times on a lot of things on this earth gets pretty good. pointless. <laughs> but not in service to God. So what keeps us? Right here tonight in this group, there are people here as members of the church who have far more knowledge than other members of the church. Does that mean those who have more knowledge and experience in living the Christian life, they can go to heaven, and those who have less can't? Well, then what makes up the difference? What's always made up the difference? The blood of Jesus Christ flowing to cleanse us from our sins, which blood we contacted when we were baptized into his death and we enjoyed the propitiation that Christ made for us on Calvary's cross and our sins were covered. That's the importance of understanding how it is and the kind of sins we may commit and those that are hardened sins where we've gone back to the world as Galatians 6 tells us about a person who sins and we with your spiritual restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. That's a person that's overtaken that trespass or fault. He has not repented. And the faithful are trying to get him to repent. That's because the second law of pardon that we mention most often. Well, that person cannot have the blood of Christ cleansing from his sins. Why? He won't repent of a given sin or sins in his life. Well, that person then is not having the seed remaining in him. The seed remaining in him means it's affecting him, it's changing him, it's guiding him. And it can't do that unless he wants it to. And you won't become a Christian unless you want to. And you won't give up false doctrine unless you want to. And you won't remain faithful to God unless you want to. It's all in the want to. That's where it comes down to. It always has been. So, whosoever will... Let him come and take the water of life freely. But what about the whosoever wants? They won't have the water of life at all. But for those who have the seed of the Word of God remaining in them, then they're governed by the Word of God. They readily confess their sins daily. I don't hear a prayer led here. I don't believe in this service. Not just this service, but any of our worship periods. 
where I would say nearly every case, not, not, not all, but nearly every case, where the prayer leader says, Father, please forgive us of our sins or something of the thing. Well, why? Because we're keenly aware of our humanity. That's why. And that's what the Lord wants to see in us, brethren. He wants to see how we know of ourselves we can't make it. We must totally depend on Him. And thus we sing songs that say, Let Him have His way with thee. And I'm the only one that can stop Him from letting Him have His way with me. So if you're not a Christian this evening, and you know whether you are or you aren't, you know whether you've obeyed that form of doctrine or you haven't, you know whether your baptism is uh, the baptism of the Great Commission, the baptism we talked about this evening, or whether man's doctor did all up. Man's doctor did up won't work. Because baptism that saves you is the one Peter talked about when he said, 1 Peter 3, 21, baptism does also now save us. Yeah, but, well, it still says he doth also now save us. Well, I think this. Well, it still says he doth also now save us. What does? Baptism. And you can argue from now to the day that the Lord looks at you and condemns you to torment, and it'll still be saying, baptism doth also now save us. I'm not saying it saves you alone. No, belief and repentance, confession of faith in Christ precedes it. That qualifies you to obey it. So baptism can save you from your past sins and the Lord adds you to his church. And then you live the Christian life and the blood continues to cleanse you until we're all gathered before the throne of God, blood-bought throne, to hear, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter ye into the joys of thy Lord. As a child of God, if you've sinned, we've studied what to do about that. So we hope we'll keep our hearts tender and easily picked by the Word of God, and that we'll do daily what we're taught to do, examine ourselves and see whether we'll be in the faith. If we'll do that, so an entrance will be made abundantly, and to the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. If you're subject to the Lord's invitation, we invite you to come while we stand and while we sing.